hope that was okay. We ended up speeding through the dock in a couple of cases, voluntarily got continued. So we're ready to go on Tim Pell? All right, let's begin. Yeah. Anybody need? Uh, yeah, I would like to reserve five minutes uh, for five minutes. Five minutes. May it please the court, Timothy Weber here on behalf of Michael Timko, the former husband in this proceeding. We've raised four issues on appeal. Uh, some of those we're going to rely upon our briefs, but we want to talk about two today. One is the for sale of the marital home on rehearing, and the other one is the 401k uh, equitable distribution. Let's jump ahead to the sale of the home, which was our last point, but we've raised the fact it was just an abuse of discretion for the trial court to force the sale of the Tampa home for the first time on rehearing solely as a result of delay in the adjudication of the case and administrative convenience to the trial court. When in fact the former husband had been awarded exclusive use and possession of the home as early as 19, 2019, trial is delayed because of COVID in 20. They have a trial in March of 21. The trial judge doesn't even enter a final judgment following that trial till June of 22. And then by November of 22, after the former husband had lived in the home with visiting his children, his children staying there, et cetera, um, the trial judge reversed his course. Grants relief wasn't asked in the original final hearing, wasn't awarded in the original final judgment and decides we're going to force the sale of the Tampa home now. And why? Because he didn't want to have to reopen the evidence to get into the issue of mortgage credit. Where, where did we place the apparent statement your client made about wanting to sell a house and move on to Pinellas? So again, that goes into a time issue, okay? So originally he was living in the Clearwater house and by mid-19, there's exclusive use and possession, the Clearwater house to the wife, the Tampa house to the husband. There's a trial in 21. There is a statement made by the husband that he was considering selling the Tampa house and looking for a house in Pinellas to be closer to where the kid's school was. I certainly don't think that that is uh, some kind of binding situation that he says that in March of 21, during his trial testimony, he was considering relocating. And fast forward to November of 22, after he maintained at trial that he wanted the Tampa house awarded to him, it was awarded to him. And by November of 22, after he'd been living there over three and a half years, the trial court, for reasons that don't seem to be valid reasons, I think that's the problem. Is there really no logic or justification other than delay in the judicial proceeding and uh, the avoidance of reopening the evidence to consider well, does the more court have discretion to do what the court did, or is this an error of law or both? What are you saying? So I'm saying both. I'm saying, number one, uh, to the extent it's discretionary, there's an abuse of discretion. Number two, um, we believe that 61075 sub H, which talks about the equitable distribution factors and the desirability of maintaining a home for the children, um, is something that the trial court just failed to consider. There's no mention in the rehearing or in the amended final judgment um, about the children and the fact that this is yet the only home left that they know at this point in time. Both parties stipulated to um, selling the Clearwater home and that was baked into the cake from the very beginning of the trial. In fact, it was taken out of the trial, the Clearwater home, and by November of 22, the only place these children ever knew as a home to go to was the Tampa home where they spent time with the husband. And so what, what is it? What is the standard review on abuse of discretion that no reasonable trial, trial judge would have done what this judge did? Or well, I, I think that the court has recognized that a failure to consider the statutory factors is ipso facto an abuse of discretion. Well, well yeah, but ipso facto, that's also an error of law. Correct. But but in addition to that, no reasonable trial judge would have done it. And under Canacris, the issue is, was there logic and justification for the result? And the logic and justification here is delay and administrative convenience of the trial judge. Well, I guess that's your take on it. Uh, I guess 
I go back and if anything is suggested that the judge took into account prior testimony or statement from a former husband about the cell phone. He referenced that in the amended final judgment, but when you look at the transcript of the hearing, the hearing is about the wife reopening the evidence for Kelly credits. And what the judge says is, well, uh, the only fair thing to do now to consider post judgment appreciation in the Tampa home is for me to sell it. He's concerned with the valuation uh, that all this was done as of March 21. And now the wife is saying, well, I've been making mortgage payments. He's been making mortgage payments. The real estate market is different. And at this point in time, he says, oh, well, the only fair thing to do is sell both properties now. That's not really about the husband's desires. Well, could it be, is it abuse of discretion to consider an easy way to resolve these issues? Well, I would submit that without considering the statutory factors, and I don't see that as one of the statutory factors, administrative convenience of the trial judge, and I don't see, you know, um, delay is one of the factors. The fact is there was a trial in March 21. The evidence on value was presented. The house was awarded to the husband at that value as of March of 21. And that's where things stood until the wife came back and said, now I want to raise the issue of mortgage credits because of all this delay in the proceeding. And so at that point in time, just a mere continuation of the divorce proceeding and the failure to get to a final judgment becomes the only reason to sell the Tampa home. And it's the one argued by the former wife's counsel. Well, let me ask you a question. The Tampa home was valued at 235. I believe that was the number. And the Clearwater home was valued at 884,000. Uh, the Clearwater home- stipulated to sell that. It was never valued. It was just the stipulation. We're gonna sell it and split let's, it equally. Let's say it's three to four times the value of the Tampa home. Is that true or false? I don't believe it's on that magnet. So whatever they get from the sale of both these homes is more than enough to give cash to purchase another home or maybe the same home or a home down the block. Is that possible? Well, I mean, certainly the parties are going to receive cash out of the sale of both properties. Uh, the issue here is one blessing in disguise because of the timing of the market, but who knows? But doesn't that go to discretion? Maybe the court has some thing in mind that didn't articulate there was no was there a motion to rehearing to say judge you can't do that and explain why you did it this this all occurred for the first time on rehearing so it, it, it all happened in the rehearing I, mean, I want to jump into the 401k issue real quick um the, the trial judge's conclusion that a worker who continues to contribute to his 401k after getting married is commingling funds with his premarital portion of the 401k. I think that's just an issue of law that this court can reject. Um, I, 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 I scratched my head and I, I saw that result, but is there not an evidentiary issue as to the number of shares that uh, your client had at or about the time of the event? <laughs> So it's, it's undisputed that if the Rainier small mid cap, there was 1166 point dot 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 shares of premarital Rainier mid cap. 200 of those were done in the J bill 401k before marriage. And the other ones were acquired from the two prior premarital 401k accounts, the Intuit and the Broadcom. So, that testimony was even elicited by the wife's counsel during the trial from the husband. We all agree, right, Mr. Timko, that it's 1,166 shares. Yes. Okay. And for some reason, I so that the trial, the trial judge concluded that was not necessarily accurate. Well, he concluded it was it was already uh, commingled because it was the same 401k that had the premarital amounts that he put postmarital earnings into. I think that fundamentally misunderstands. A 401k is not something that you choose. It's tied to your employer. It's one account. You can't say, I want a separate 401k account for my post-marriage contributions. The evidentiary issue comes in the fact that the employer chooses to change platforms. So the employer has the fidelity listing of investments. Here's what we're offering the J-Bill employees. And tomorrow it's going to be Merrill Lynch. And it's an entirely different platform. 
the trial judge finds that Kim coaches decided to change brokerage firms, liquidate his account to cash, and that was commingling. And that again fundamentally misunderstands. Right. 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 Correct. And the trial judge's conclusion that Mr. Timko just like went out and decided to change brokerage firms one day from Fidelity to to Merrill Lynch is just not supported by the record. The testimony from Mr. Timko was J Bill changed the platforms. And so he's forced. I'm still, I'm still struggling. If I accept what you're saying, I'm, I'm coping. I'm still sort of grasping at the, the issue as to whether it was sufficient evidence as yeah. to the number of shares. That... So, so now we're here at this point, and we have the December 31, 2012 statement from Fidelity, and it shows the Rainier small mid cap statements. And then we roll in, and he sells his all in one stock here, and he purchases all in one stock here. Now, the trial judge faulted him for not having the first quarter 13 uh, Merrill Lynch statement attached to his composite exhibit 67. But exhibit 67 itself, the summary, has the information from the statement. It's on the exhibit, admitted in the evidence, and the trial judge's legal conclusion was that a summary is not evidence. And that's erroneous. So it's a summary of the January to March 13 statement, put in the summary, the tracing is there. We had 2,900 shares of Rainier small mid cap. This was the percent that was non-marital. We had 5,101 shares of prime cap Odyssey and the new platform. Why don't we get the same percentage in that as non-marital? And so the trial judge reaches two erroneous conclusions of commingling, adding money into the account after you get married, which I would submit is wrong, and um, that he voluntarily did all this and decided to change brokerage firms and went to cash. And so I would submit that out of all this, you have to at least recognize there are two 401ks that were premarital that are rolled over. And one of the things a 401k administrator has to do is segregate out the rollover contributions from employee deferrals and employer matches. And the wife's statement, wife put in exhibit 91 into evidence at 2460 in the record, showed $115,000 from rollover sources in the account as of date of filing. And how did the trial judge ignore that evidence if we just gave him the broad common intuit rollover source accounts, it's $115,000. And so I would submit that we had a view of the evidence that was infected by this erroneous belief of commingling that infected the entire treatment of the 401k and resulted in a depriving the husband of non-marital assets. And the statute's very clear. If I take a non-marital asset and I buy another non-marital asset with it, that, that asset's non-marital. And um, I would submit that they're, they're, the trial court aired there. I, I'll just briefly touch on the, the battery issue. The battery issue is kind of interesting. Whenever you get to talk about Prosser and Keaton, you go back to first uh, semester torts. But the trial judge here somehow felt like he had to find a violation of the criminal battery statute in order to grant relief on a common law battery claim. So he injected into the analysis elements of intent to harm, which is not an element of common law battery. He injected into it um, actual damages, which is not an element. Nominal damages are proper in a common law battery. And the facts of this are undisputed. I mean, the, the, the same story that the husband was presenting is the same story the wife admitted to at the trial, and it constitutes a harmful or offensive contact done intentionally by the wife. Whether she intended to harm him, whether she intended to do anything else, it was an offensive contact. We cited the cases in, in, in Prosser and Keaton on what the actual standard is. It's undisputed. The trial judge so puts his... So how is it actually a contact? You, you allege that she has, was putting holy water and sugar, I guess, in, in, in his coffee. 
Right. Right. So you always remember the classic case where the person pulls the lawn chair out when somebody's about to sit down and they make contact with the ground. It's substantially certain to occur when she knows that he goes to the sugar bowl every morning and his coffee cup every morning. She knows that he's going to come in contact with that substance. And when I would submit that that is an intent to create the contact is evident from the, the video evidence, which is undisputed, described in the trial judge's final order. She's, you know, looking I mean, around tenuous before she I'm actually really surprised you're pushing it. It's but really tenuous. It, it's not tenuous on issue of liability. All we're looking for is nominal damages to recognize the fact that that was not a rightful action to it's take. Certainly, yes, sir. Uh, mischief for getting a divorce case resolved and is certainly salaries when it's already probably a bad situation for both spouses. Yeah, I mean, surreptitiously placing something in your spouse's drink while you're going through a divorce is certainly a creation for a mischief. Well, I don't want to interrupt you, but you're at four, four minutes and 20 seconds. You can keep going or save it. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save the balance of my time, but um, the the travel to Mexico thing. Again, we have a flip-flop on rehearing without justification. It's a dangerous place and it's not unreasonable to require that there not be travel to a place with a travel restriction greater than two. Thank you. All right. I'll, I'll save you four minutes. You may use the water. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. Um, my name is Andrew Weiserkowski and I represent the former wife. Uh, Claire Timko, the petitioner in the underlying divorce action. Um, I would like to start with addressing the issue of the sale of the TAM home. The trial court did not abuse its discretion in finding the sale of Tampa, Tampa home was warranted and the most fair and equitable way to divide the equity of the property is to have it sold and equally divide the net proceeds of the sale. The court did take into consideration those factors that counsel say now in the amended final judgment the court did make those particular findings of the Let me ask you a question was there a reason why your client wanted the property sold in tampa i mean it wasn't a lot of money compared to the value of the Clearwater house the, i th i think the reason was to try to make it as equitable as 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 fair as possible both they had two homes let's sell the homes divide the proceeds of the homes then let's divide the equitable that's distribution. it okay fair enough um and the court um in this particular matter it's an abuse of discretion standard when you divide assets the court has wide the trial court has wide discretion into what it considers the court considered the fact the court considered the fact that the husband did have exclusive use of possession and that was still granted in other words he did have exclusive use of possession of the home until it gets sold. So he does have that. Um, and then once the home sold, the other home sold, the court found a way to equitably divide the rest of the assets to make this a fair um, divorce. Um, as to the, again, I would emphasize that the abuse of discretion um, is it, could any reasonable um, person uh, make a different conclusion? Well, the, the, part of the problem is the court changed its mind on the sale of the Tampa home. Pardon me? The court changed its mind on the sale of the Tampa home. I think the court was, when you look at the equitable distribution schedule, I think the court tried to make the fair result for these parties. I think the court has that discretion. And, and at that point in time, did not abuse its discretion. I mean, the court didn't give a particular reason why. Um, the court, in its in its finding, I believe the court gave a reason that it is within their discretion, and to make this high conflict case get to the point of the finish line. The finish line being let's let's make an equalizing payment. Let's get these parties on their way to parent the kids because this is a 50-50 type time sharing. Let's just sell these particular properties, get them on their way, and get them without so the mind. rationale provided. The court didn't come out of the clear blue and hit the parties with this. No, the husband, and throughout the trial, he said he kept on saying he was a court pointer. Now, 
uh, I want to sell the house. I want to be close with the kids. I want to sell the house. I want to be close with the kids. That was that was his testimony. That was throughout the case. And so I think the trial court just did what they thought was was a good idea for this particular family. Um, in terms of the issue of the 401ks, what we have here in this particular instance, Your Honor. Um, it's abundantly clear, though, that the husband did not have anything to do with the change of these plans, right? With the change of the of, of, of the 401k, you know, provider. I mean, this was done by his employer, who basically said instead of using this group, we're going to use this group. I, so it wasn't as though he was um, either adding to or, or or effectuated this change. It was done by his employer, and not just for him, but for everybody in these plans. It seems that way. We start off the most recent was Merrill Lynch. The so platform. how is that co-mingling? And the, well, the co what I think the, the, the trial court what, had a difficult time with saying, hey, give me some evidence, give me some competent substantial evidence to parcel out the portion that is non-marital in this case. Um, the Merrill Lynch is the latest one that exhibit, um, exhibit I think 63, where it shows that, hey, this is what this account is worth right now, 350 some thousand dollars. So that is in itself, that Merrill Lynch is a marital asset. Now, how do we come up with a marital, non-marital component of that marital asset? It's up to the husband in this case to prove and to show by, uh, by evidence, by clear, convincing, substantial type of evidence to show, hey, this is what the non-marital portion is. And I think, and I, I believe that the court struggled with that because the husband did not pr prove that. There was a numbers issue and we have different numbers given today, an argument versus numbers given in the rehearing. There was never a solid number of what that non-marital component is. Now, how is the judge to make that determination if he's not given the particular evidence to support the non-marital component? We don't have that amount to so this day. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mr. Weber makes the point that either the actual statements were there or a summary of statements that show the amount of shares going into the marriage. There, there is statements that there are some monies going in, but at the same time, Chad, well, he, there's contr marital contributions. What happens to that non-marital portion? What is that non-marital portion? Did it go up? Did it go down? That has never been proven. That is. What should have been done is we should have gotten somebody to come in and testify to the numbers. This is what the non-marital portion was. Get a laser light on that. This is what the non-marital portion was in 2008, in 2012, 2016, and 2018. That was never done. So there was never any of that substantial evidence. And so what this trial court found that the, um, the petitioner, that the husband um, did not prove the non-marital component by clear and substantial evidence in this case. And I think that um, when you look at the evidence, um, this court shouldn't reevaluate the evidence. The trial judge in this case had taken all the circumstances into consideration, the, total, the totality of it, and he was weighing the evidence, he was looking at it, and he was able to make that determination. There was not enough here for him to parcel out the exact amount and I think that's lacking. I think as a result, the court had made a finding that this is a entire count as marital. And Can I shift gears on you? The Mexico travel. Yes. Mexico travel, originally the restriction was that uh, can't travel, can't travel anywhere where the State Department said it's a level two uh, cautionary zone. And, and, and the court obviously changed from that and basically put other restrictions in place about travel. I think the travel, again, is an abuse of discretion standard yeah. at any time of parenting plan. And in this particular case, what I, the court did, it, it struck a balance between the concerns of the husband and, and the wife's ability to have these children travel and see their parents, see the extended family. And what the court did, if you look at the parenting plan, the court set up specific requirements, specific um, standards for these folks to follow when it comes to out of country travel. One of them is 60 day notice. We're not going to travel anywhere unless each party gives the other party 60 day notice of where are you going. That gives sufficient time for in this case, the husband wanted to say, hey, I don't agree with the Mexican travel because because the restrictions, because the concerns I have for the safety. 
gives them the opportunity to come into court and say no. Number two, the court left the husband in charge of the passports. So those passports are not to be released until seven days prior to the travel. So it gives a husband some latitude over any kind of concerns. But ultimately what the judge found, and it's discretion properly, is that this mom, she is very, maybe overprotective of these children. And he found that this mother um, is going to protect these kids from any harm, any way, any shape. And that's what ultimately this court did and find that after seeing the conduct of the mother, seeing her behaviors as he found that this mother truly is a protective mother of these children. And as a result of that, he did allow both parties to take the kids out of the country. Um, as to the issue of the battery, I think the court was spot on in this uh, 63 page final amended final judgment to say that this produced nothing but more high conflict, high drama between these parties. And I think in a marital family law case, the, the trial judge, again, sitting in that position, sees these litigants. And this was a stretch for Mr. Timko to say, hey, I had some water poured out, some holy water poured in my coffee. Oh, it's a battery. I got damaged. It was an intent to harm me. And I think that was a stretch. It's almost akin to, you know, wife putting um, non-dairy creamer in somebody's coffee when, instead of creamer, instead of regular creamer. Um, so in this particular case, that just created the high conflict and the judge saw for that. And the judge also made the finding that there was no harm. There was no intent by the wife to harm the husband in any way. Um, and so the court made the proper finding and, and did say that this added to the high conflict in this particular divorce case. And so, again, it was a proper dismissal. And when I look at the totality of these, this judgment, Your Honors, it's a 63-page judgment. It has a parenting plan, it has an equitable distribution schedule, has everything that a trial court could have done in this case. It explains all the reasoning, the rationale this court gave for its findings. And so I would ask the, this court to read that, and look at that minute final judgment, because it really gives an explanation of what was going through the judge's mind. And I think he did a, what I would say is a job for a lot of lawyers to look at something like this and, and, and educate themselves from it. And if it, there's any other questions, I'll conclude. Thank you. Yeah, so. The trial judge valued the Tampa home at 230 in the final judgment. By definition, he'd already made a fair distribution. And so the, the argument I'm hearing here is, oh, well, he did this so he can make a fair distribution. Well, he'd already made a fair distribution. And the other, what I would call an admission in that argument is, oh, we well, just wanted to get the case to a finish line. And that's what we say is the invalid motivating reason on the, the ordering the but sale. If, if, if the former wife comes in the first time and says, oh, by the way, I, I want to do something about uh, the portion of the voice of any regard, because of that, that sort of upsets what the judge had already allocated, is it not? Well, and so there's two ways to respond to that. One is to take the evidence and award the credits, or two, to say, you didn't ask for any credits at the trial, and it's too late. But to say, oh, well, I'm just going to go in now and, and punish the husband or the children or whatever the case may be um, and sell the other house, that's not a good reason either. And that's what exactly what our point is, is this is being done for administrative convenience as a result of delays in the case. And those are not good reasons to make these types of decisions. He'd already made a fair distribution, uh, and that was in the final judgment. Um, on the issue of the switching of, of platforms, um, the wife was an employee of J. Bill. She had to switch from the Rainier small mid cap to the prime cap Odyssey as well. And it's the best evidence um, that it was not some kind of voluntary choice on that. And then again, um, it was argued in the brief, uh, answer brief, and again here orally that there's a requirement of intent to harm for 
common law battery. Um, there's no such requirement in the law. We've cited the cases on that. And the trial judges supposedly model final judgment. The entire analysis on that is just wrong as a matter of law. Um, going into criminal statutes and the Civil Remedies for Criminal Practices Act. It was a common law battery claim. And he did everything but address the four elements of common law battery. And that's, I mean, it's just there as a matter of law to apply the wrong legal standard to a claim. Whether it was a ill-advised claim, whether it was helpful in resolving the case, um, still the trial judge had a duty and obligation to apply the elements of the common law tort as they are and to, to apply what are undisputed facts. And on the issue of offensiveness of this kind, there was evidence that she drew holy water from a communal vat at a local Catholic church. And that was offensive to Mr. Timko of what could be in such a communal vat of people dipping their hands in there. It's disgusting. And disgust is enough to establish a common law battery. Not to mention, it was also indicated he wasn't even Catholic anymore. He goes to a Christian church. And the idea that she would be having to administer holy water to him for her bizarre incantations about his uh, supposedly sexually abusing their children that were all false. Um, that's the reason why she would be doing that. And so um, the battery was proven as, as a matter of law. The elements are all there, it's undisputed. The travel to Mexico, um, we'll give you notice and, and let you hold the passports to the last minute. That is not a protection of the children by the trial court. And at worst, it's an abdication of making a decision. Well, I don't, I don't want to make this decision now. Come back later uh, under the gun uh, for emergency hearing. You know.